Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. For the last 32 years, an organization by the name of the National Hispanic Institute has been conducting its work quietly out of the state of Texas, and it has now become an international organization that has quietly now become the leading and largest Latino youth organization in the Americas, not only in the United States, but also in six other countries. Over 85,000 alumni thus far, over 98% of them getting accepted to top colleges and universities, 66% of them going on to graduate studies, and a high index of them, over 86% remaining involved in the future of their communities. The organization was one that I got involved with when I was 14 years of age, and I have sitting with me the president of the National Hispanic Institute and founder who has known me personally since I was 14. He's a great friend. He's also published a couple of books, Third Reality, Crafting a 21st Century Latino Agenda, as well as Third Reality Revealed. The president of the National Hispanic Institute, Ernesto Nieto, a great friend. Ernie, thank you for joining me. Thank you for inviting. So here we are, 32 years later, and um, I wanted to invite you to the show because there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of buzz about our organization about what is ongoing. Uh, one of the very reasons why I was uh, invited to, to, to be on Fronteras of Changing America was precisely because of the work NHI was conducting. And uh, folks here at uh, PBS and at KRWG said, you know, Hector, I think it'd be a great opportunity to have an ongoing discussion about things ongoing throughout not only the United States, but in the Americas and how we have a shifting America. You've been at the forefront of this for 30 years. How did this happen? How did NHI quietly become the organization that it's become today? What the viewing audience may not know about me is that I spent, from the time I was about 23 years old till I was 39 years old, uh, really critically examining developments in the Latino community, not only in Texas, but throughout the United States, um, and forming the idea behind, the, behind or the concept uh, behind the Institute, there were a couple of things that were noteworthy. One is that the Latino community was going to grow at a phenomenal rate. That was predicted by every ph demographer around. What was always never mentioned is that with growth also comes the need for larger numbers of prepared leaders. If you grow, you need more leaders. Second thing, where are we going to get them? What level of education uh, must they have? What kind of exposure uh, must they have? All of these things led me to, to think about the creation of an organization whose chief purpose would be to provide our community of growing Latinos with the kind of leadership that was needed in the 21st century, not in the past. There was a third factor involved. I come from a generation of the civil rights, El Movimiento, as it was right. called back then. The Cesar Chavez, Reyes Lopez Tijerina. You personally we, knew a lot of these I folks. sat at the table, ate with them, marched with them, did all my craziness, and had a great time. And it was a needed era to say, you know what, we're getting left out, and, and this shouldn't happen. And we're angry, we're pissed off about it. You know, let's, let's change the way things are. What was different is that in the 70s, we began to see a lot of Latinos uh, being um, given the opportunity to go to college. But also with that came the dispersal. We began to move out of barrios. When I grew up, doctors, lawyers, uh, teachers, dentists, we all lived together. Yeah. So I could go to the drugstore named Mr. Alvarez or the teacher lived around the block. The, the 70s, the later 70s and early 80s, there was a dispersal. So there was a disconnect, and corporate America was literally gobbling up our, our brain power that was being developed. So what was urgent, and then we began to see civil rights leaders get old, retire, and die. There was no replacement. 
There was no one that was going to assume responsibility for becoming engaged in the life of the Latino community. That gave me the impetus to say, I want to help participate in creating the next generation of leaders. What was, what was different for me and the, the most challenging ta task that was then and continues to be today is for what world? And what does that mean? And what kind of truths and assumption, assumptions and beliefs must be inculcated in the minds of young people as we move forward. So we knew we had to depart from the past, our thinking, our beliefs, and I knew that we were going to also have to be concerned with what a lot of people were concerned about. What happens to the underdeveloped child? What happens to the poor? What happens to people who are disenfranchised? What happens to the immigrant? What happens to the underdeveloped? And I began to realize, Hector, that we had a very deficit view of Latinos. When we thought about Latinos, era la gente que no tenía, whatever, right. you know, it, we were the labels for everyone, people of color, the disadvantaged, the at risk. Who wants to live in that community? And so what I saw was a disconnect between the socially mobile Latino that wanted to do things and the rest of the community that could no longer do things. One of, one of my favorite stories that, that you always tell, and, and you share a little bit in your books, is the story of how you came to have these realizations about what the leadership model, uh, or rather in what direction the leadership model should go, because I think it's an evolving direction. But you, you talk about the first years of NHI's inception and how a lot of the influence of the leadership model back then was kind of having on the organization and how that led you to kind of shift where you were going because you weren't getting the results. Uh, I, well, I can tell you right now, uh, I end, uh, ended up getting so frustrated that I literally moved out of Austin and I bought a rancho, it's called Maxwell, and you've been there. Right, uh, NHI headquarters I wanted today. to get away from everybody, old thinking. I wanted to get away from what I call the civil, civil rights mentality, the mentality, the mentality of advocacy and reform. The, the mentality of wanting to join the American mainstream. I wanted to get away from all those overwhelming views that were shaping and guiding uh, Latinos. Now here's something that's really, really important. As suburban communities grew, these kids didn't have a memory for the past anymore. They were more, they wanted to go where you went, Hector. They wanted to go to Georgetown University. They wanted, they wanted to, to go to, to, to Harvard. Schools. They wanted to big time. There's no problem with that but they were not necessarily young men and women who were doing it because they also wanted to participate in the Latino community. They understood these name brand institutions as their tickets to mainstream, to get in the big five accounting firms, to land a big position with government or corporate America. That's how they saw their futures. Honestly, it really bothered me. In the 80s, these kids came back, hi Ernie, you know, like their understanding of Latinos uh, was nowhere, to be honest about it. And I, and I at, at the risk of alienating some of my older alums, I began <laughs> to feel that they were more of a threat to the La future Latino community than an asset because they were being driven by mainstream perceptions of our own community. Se estaban separando ellos mismos. In just because words, they had an education? Just because of the kinds of schools that they were going to, because of the kinds of attitudes that they were being influenced to adopt. Uh, they were becoming the kinds of people that were kind of perching themselves and saying, we know better than the Latino community. And so that bothered us a lot. Uh, up, up until, up until um, well, as far as I've known the story, and maybe it may be a little different uh, than, than what I remember it to be, but colleges and universities have always kind of looked to NHI, to you, to the work that you're kind of doing, saying, we're kind of interested in that. And, and I know that, that schools kind of began to circle around NHI, colleges and universities, saying, we're interested in these students. And now there's over 100 colleges and universities that are affiliated with NHI, all you know, top tier institutions, Stanford, MIT, NYU, Villanova, Southwestern, institutions of that caliber. Um, so initially, the students went off to these schools, and you thought, leaders or yeah they were not but they, they weren't they weren't and and what's interesting about it, who doesn't want a winner these kids their study habits were very developed 
they were bound to succeed because that's the way they were being developed by their parents. These were the smart kids. And they dedicated a lot of time to their studies. There is no doubt that these are very dedicated, very focused young people. Here's the deal. They were really being prepared to simply join the American workforce. They were seen as work units, mm -hmm. maybe at a professional level. Maybe they were going to do better than their parents, but they were still merely being preparados to go work, to be in middle management, entry management positions, make companies look good, fulfill their so-called diversity goals. Invariably, these young men and women were not looked at as game changers in Latino community life. That was not a consideration in their head. So historically, so that we put this picture together, in the 1990s, we introduced the concept of third reality. And the whole concept of third reality was for these young men and women to begin to take a look at what are we being taught by mom and pop? What are we being taught to believe in, to assume to be true? Or what are the assumptions we're learning about this? What are we being taught by institutions about ourselves? You know, how, what does that mean to our future? And what they began to understand was that not everything they're taught by the families is good, nor is it all bad, but that they had to take a critical look at what they were being taught and why. I've always used the term, we have more to unlearn than to learn yeah. or relearn. And what is it that they were learning from colleges and universities? And one of the things that we came across is that they had no basis for analysis and that they really didn't know what that meant. And here was a critical point. We would ask them the question, and how do you plan to share your intelligentsia, your intelligence, your capacities to help change lives and advance quality of life for Latinos? I'd get that look of, what do you mean? And it was always a pro bono. Oh, once I become successful, I'll come back. I got to tell you a little game that's very important that you remember. I get 200 kids. Mm -hmm. They sit in a group and I ask them a question. I'll say, oh, you're African-American. I'll take a kid and you're white and you're Latino and you're Asian. And I'm a millionaire. This is a make-believe game. And I said, if I were to give you a million dollars with a proviso that you've got to invest in one of these groups to guarantee that money doubling in, in 30 days or less, <clears throat> which group would you invest in first, second, third, and last? You remember the game. Of course. And I know the outcome, too. The outcome it's a is shocking always one. they're going to go with the Asians first. Of course. And you go, why Asians? And you're talking to Latino families. Absolutely. Right. And they'll go, well, you, everybody knows that Asians are very smart. And I'll say, that's not true. But you believe that they're smart. Who's next? They would always pick the white. Third was African-American, last us, Latinos. Second question. This is question has been going on for 30 years just about. If you were caught in the middle of some place, in the middle of God knows where, in the middle of the night with your spouse and children, and you wanted to get home to your, to your hotel safely, who would you trust to get you there safely? And I always use the, the, the word trust. The impression is they'll tell you Asian, I'll go, why? Well, they know karate, right? <laughs> And, and the next People one, operating under the yeah, stereotype. They, they, they pick african American. Why? Because they're rough and tough. Really? I'll be darned. And who would you pick? Then they pick Latinos, maybe the Anglo last. Mm -hmm. The last question was, you've wasted all your money, and you're down to $5,000, and you want to, you love your grandmother, and you want to fix her leaky roof. Right. You want good quality work, but you don't want to pay a lot of money. Who would you pick first? And they all start snickering. They all start laughing, and they know it's Latino first because it's cheap labor. Now, here's a critical question. How can you be a leader in a community in which you have little faith? And you proceed with such deficit. And they have a very deficit understanding. And so they perceive their role as being on top of these people and having to pick them up and how, somehow guide them to the light, wherever that light is. How do you respond to people that say, and I've, I've heard these questions leveraged before, but Ernesto, there's 
our, our main goal is to try and get these students educated. That's, that's priority number one. Let's get them to go to great institutions. Like, let's get them to top uh, places to go. Let, let's get them to go to Goldman Sachs. That's a net gain for us. Why are you so uh, against a student being that successful? What's your response to it's, that? It's because of the way in which they define success. Okay, success to us is in how you spend and engage your life and in, in, in supporting and engaging other people. How do you help better lives of others? How do you change lives? Not how much do you make. That's important and having, there's nothing wrong with having strong incomes. But that is not our God. What we want to make sure is that these are conscious, socially conscious individuals that see themselves playing multiple roles in the life of the communities where they reside. So it's just not owning the BMW and having the five bedroom home and you know going off somewhere for vacation. Those are important victories and I think there's nothing wrong in, in applauding them when those things come about. But that has become the measure of American success. As Latinos, we have a different philosophy. And we want to make sure que abrazamos los otros, that we are involved in the lives of other people, helping them prosper as well. So it's a very different definition, and it's driven by involvement, civic engagement, caring, uh, being part of life at the community where you reside, not living on Park Avenue and measuring yourself from some big old a high rise apartment. So a redefinition of success. What is our definition of success? I, I, it seems like what you're trying to, what you're trying to do is redefine success beyond, I guess, the, the terms. Beyond that, a corporate understanding of what it means to be uh, simply a money earning machine. Mm -hmm. And and so we, we you know, let, let's take a look at why are we concerned about Wall Street? Why was this particular set in? Why occupy Wall Street? Because we've seen what's going on when you don't have a check and balance that creates a balance between institutions who are there, who are dealing with finance and, 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 and the kind of quality of life that we need. Why are we in debt as a society? Because we have failed to develop the kind of social and civic intelligence and engagement that keeps these institutions in check. We kind of assume that things are fine all the time. And we've come to realize, no, there was a lot of greed involved. There was a lot of money taken. There's a lot of chicanery involved. There's all kinds of things going on that we're really not that uh, 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 involved or informed about. So the more you have a civic engaged community, the better the check and balance system. We're very much about a civically engaged society of Latinos. You talk a lot about, uh, in, your, in both of your published books, um, the, the need to, you mentioned it here in our interview, the need to move outside of Austin. Naysayers along the way? Well, there's always going to be naysayers because uh, our, our, our focus as an organization is producing leaders for the Latino community. Uh, let me be quite clear about that. We cannot enjoy participating in the American experience unless we are prepared to participate in that experience. If we're going to be treated as minorities, there's no reason to participate in a system that undervalues us or does not value us at all, that sees us as a burden. We will never progress within that system. What we need is an educated society of Latinos who understands the game, participates in the American experience, understands free enterprise, and can help build a larger pie. The difference between the civil rights and the philosophy of NHI. In the civil rights, we always talked about, we want a slice of the American pie. I don't know if you remember all that. Heck, sure. pretty, but that was the, the reason that, that uh, Latinos or African Americans should be involved is because the pie was only being given to certain people and we wanted a slice of the American pie. NHI philosophy, we want to help grow a bigger pie because by help growing a bigger pie, your slice is automatically going to be bigger. <laughs> And so that's why the asset understanding of our philosophy. Let's find out. We have a community, if we look at ourselves as a global culture rather than a population of the United States, suddenly all kinds of opportunities come up. 
whether it's in Mexico, whether it's in Panama, whether it's in Argentina, Puerto Rico, no importa. It doesn't really matter. Is that if we see ourselves in that context and we begin to develop friends as young as 15 years of age, in 20 years, our opportunities to move socially, politically, economically, are going to increase tenfold. Right now, we must confine ourselves to what if we want to work within our community to our traditional understanding of Latinos as, as, a, as a minority community in the United States. That is an unhealthy view of the world. NHI promotes a global view of the world. And by doing that, we're, we're, we're simultaneously opening up opportunities. I already see NHIers who are beginning to learn to do business with their friends across borders. Never in my life did I grow up without understanding. I was more concerned about the barrio I was living in, in Houston. That was the limit of my social arena. So our social narrative has to change. And NHI has played, I believe, a major role in redefining that social narrative for young, bright Latinos. And we have yet to see the tsunami that's coming of brilliant young people who are going to really contribute to this country in a lot of ways. And to many other countries. And to many other countries. And, and you're going to see a very progressive society. Uh, I think I've called it before the, the, the discovery of a, of a vast untapped oil reserve of intelligence. And what we have to do is take an asset view of them and go, oh my God, you know, there is so much potential. We must invest in the development. And I think all of American society is going to benefit as a result. Ernie, we're down to the last few minutes of the show, about five minutes left. Um, and when you're having a great discussion, it kind of goes by that quickly. Um, you founded an organization 32 years ago that has captivated the minds of myself, uh, thousands of others. You say tsunami, maybe some may think it's, it's a little bit uh, of a big word, but 85,000 alumni is, is, is pretty significant stuff to be seven different countries. Looking back at it, your biggest you know, kind of thoughts about the, the journey that you've had thus far and what the next 30 years you think will look like? Well, I don't think I'm gonna be around for the next 30 years, I'd love to. Um, I think what we need to look forward to, I know things have happened that have been very emotional for me. Um, I think you well know that foundationally, NHI decided not to accept government grants not to accept state grants, corporate gifts, or foundation grants. Become self-sufficient. We were going to rely on our own nucleus, y dimes, our own nickels and our own dimes to do what we can do best. We wanted no strings. Uh, we wanted no controls. We wanted the opportunity to be the imagineers of our own future. It's happening. It's happening. And after 32 years, I see these little flowers coming out. Yeah. As a much older individual, I do get emotional when I know that before too long, I'm going to be in D.C. to be sitting there watching our first U.S. congressman elected to office. Um, two years ago, one of our now on our board of directors gave us uh, $150,000. And he said, there's more that's coming because of how this experience changed my life. I know that even in El Paso, there are NHIers who are either uh, occupying positions of, of importance or pursuing positions of importance in, 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 in the public sectors. And they're going to bring amazing, amazing new thought to the community because they're not here to solve problems. They're here to advance the assets of those communities. And their thinking is going to be very different. And their whole philosophy and approach of engagement is very different, very new, and very inspiring. So how do I feel about that? Uh, I was I, I would going to be an eternal fly on a wall and to say, I told you this would happen if we stop looking at our community as a problem and begin to look at our community as unfulfilled promise and for us to engage our lives and making sure that we inspire change, that we don't demand change, that we inspire love of community, inspire love of family, inspire love of our religious practices, inspire our civility, and inspire our intelligence. And that kind of action, that kind of inspiration changes lives all the time. 
I have seen it done. I saw it in the work of my parents in Houston when they were taking little barrios and nobody won it. And suddenly they were winning all the championships and people would say to my dad, Como le hace Santos? How do you do? I'm talking about the 1960s, 1950s. And my dad would say, pues el mexicano tiene mucha capacidad. We just have to give it the opportunity. And I really believe in my dad's philosophy and my mother's philosophy. And you know, I'm, I'm very grateful more than anything else to be doing this because it fulfills an important ideal of where I started as a member of my family out of Houston. Ernie, down to the last minute, and I'd like to just say, uh, you know, you, you wrote a series of books, and I, I know that the last one you talk a lot about advice for the future, and Third Reality Revealed, kind of a pattern, a guide. In, in just a handful of words, what would be your biggest advice to the current generation of rising leaders within our community? I've been looking at this Collegiate Leadership Network. The key word for me is have faith in them. Have faith. That is a very important part. Tienes que tener fe en la gente. You have to realize that they want to do well. And you can't question that. You have to open the doors to that level of opportunity. The other one is to be engaged with them. Tener, as they call it, the will to stay with, with what you say you're going to stay. It's taken me 32 years. No money. My first year, I made $8,000. That was my whole income. Four children. You have to have the will to stay with your dream. You really have to have that determination that good things happen to you. Not bad things. Good things come from will. Those two words right there. And the last one is imagination. Okay. Imagination is so key to fostering a new world. I hope this isn't the last time we have you on the show, Ernie. Uh, folks, if you want to get involved with the National Hispanic Institute, www.nhi-net.org, our conversations about a changing America will continue. For all of us here at Fronteras, have a good evening. I'm Hector H. Lopez. <laughs>